welcome. I hope you are having fun at Google I.O. The tablets simply looked awesome, so I'm sure you're having double the fun now with those tablets. Uh, quick intros, uh, my name is Nitin Mangtani. I'm a group product manager at Google. Um, I work in the commerce focus area, and uh, I'm here today to talk about shopping APIs. And with me also, I have a colleague of mine, Ali. He's going to join us um, later. So let me, let me kind of talk a little bit about, you know, what we're going to focus on today and, you know, as you walk out of this session, exactly what will you learn. So I just wanted to set the stage and talk about what are the different innovations Google is doing around shopping and shopping search. And then I'm going to switch gears a little bit and we're going to talk about how does it relate to the developer community broadly. How can you collaborate with Google and, and kind of be part of that broader ecosystem as we are doing a lot of innovations on the Google side. And this is where shopping APIs are in some ways the heart and soul of our ecosystem and developer outreach. So we're going to focus a lot on shopping APIs. And you know the shopping APIs have multiple components, so we'll talk about both about them and how they interact with the Google properties. We'll try to show you a couple of live demos um, and also go in details on the actual API and the semantics of them. But before I do that, I just wanted to step back and give you guys a little bit update on what's happening in the broader retail or the shopping arena. So if you look at the retail industry, the first online transaction happened maybe a decade or 15 years ago. Someone you know, took the credit card and bought the online. Now, you know, it's been a long time since you know, we, we went from a purely um, you know, shopping at a store to online shopping. But if you look at some of the interesting data points, what's happening is that even after 15 years, a good portion, in fact, majority of the shopping still happens at a physical store. In fact, the data shows 90% of the shopping happens in somebody's store where a user walks into the store and makes the purchase. But what's more interesting is that even though 90% of the shopping happens in a physical store, close to half, 43% of those decisions, the purchase decisions, are made in the online world, which is even before a user or a consumer walks into the store, he or she has researched that product or that brand or that retailer online and kind of made that decision. So that's why it's so important for the broader community to have that presence in the online world so that whether you are a retailer, a brand owner, or, or you are a developer, as you're thinking about shopping, it's very important that you think about what's the online presence of your shopping initiatives. And last but not the last, at least, you know, there were a lot of data points um, mid last year which were predicting that the smartphones which will outsell the desktop computers sometime in 2012 and 2013. Guess what? It happened last quarter of 2010. It didn't even take us 2012 or 13, which is a pretty interesting <clears throat> phenomena. If you look at the evolution of computing and some of the other computing paradigms and their adoption, mobile is one of the fastest uh, growing technologies. And what's happening is it's blending this worlds of what we used to call it online shopping versus in-store shopping. These two worlds are getting blended, which is from a consumer point of view, it doesn't matter. A user can start the research online, but actually purchase the transaction going into the store. You can have that mobile device is bridging that gap. Because on the mobile device, you can do the research and you can even find the stores near you which carry that item. And then it will even show you the direction so you can just drive to that store and pick that item. So it's a very interesting dynamics which is changing how shoppers look at you know, broader retail industry and how they are interacting with retailers in general. So let's look at uh, some of the interesting things that are happening on the Google side. So I think most of you might be aware of Google Shopping or Google Product Search. So if you type in any product related query on Google and you can try this, uh, for example, digital camera, we would show you these different cameras and we'll also show you the information about them, ratings, reviews, the price, and the retailers that they can buy from. So this application has been live for a while, and I'm sure many of you might be already playing with this. Um, the, the interesting thing, which I'm going to connect the dots pretty soon, is I'll show you how what you see here on the consumer side is related to the shopping APIs and how shopping APIs play an important role in feeding this data to Google. So one of the APIs, which we're going to go in a lot more detail, is called Content API, which is basically the heart and soul of our infrastructure, and that's how these items get listed um, on Google Shopping. The, the next innovation we did is, uh, back in the days when you typed in a query digital camera, we would show you the same camera and the same image multiple times, basically showing you all the retailers that sell those products. And obviously, 
from a consumer point of view, that wasn't the best experience. So we, we improved the experience a lot by creating this something we call it a product page, which is this particular camera, Canon PowerShot, is sold by multiple retailers. In fact, 158 uh, retailers, but it's the same product. There's no point showing that image 158 times or the description or the ratings and reviews. Because no matter whom you buy this product for, the product remains the same. So we created this canonical catalog pages for, for the products so that as a consumer, as you are typing in a query, we show you this product page, you can look at all the information about the product, and then at the bottom grid, you see all the retailers. We still show you the retailer's rating, because that's equally important. Once you know that this is the right product to buy, you also want to know that which is the right retailer to purchase this product. So that's where we show you that information, and then we show you the price and other attributes. So that's kind of was the next evolution in Google's um, shopping. The third thing <clears throat> which I mentioned to you, you know, mobile is a pretty interesting paradigm. Uh, in fact, I, if I look at my own personal behavior and some of the shopping uh, queries that we see on Google, uh, this is increasing at a much faster pace than any other avenue, which is users are using shopping and mobile as the primary conduit to do the shopping. And at Google, we launched this application called Google Shopper, which essentially allows you to scan a barcode or an image and will find the products which match that description or that UPC code and will tell you all the information about it. How many people have downloaded Google Shopper? Close to half. So for the rest of you, please try so. It's a, it's a free application, and it's available both on Android and iPhone. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, it kind of shows you the power of what you can do with a, with a mobile device. Now this is something which is my personal favorite, which is mobile meets local. So we went from desktop-based shopping to a canonical product to mobile, and then this is the ultimate nirvana, where now I can not only search that product, but it tells me precisely that this item is available on these stores near me. And in fact, we get, and this is why the API is important, we get these real-time inventory feeds from all these retailers, so we can precisely tell you whether this item is on the shelf at that store or not. Because the opposite of it is you find a product, you like it, you drive to a store, and guess what? That item is not available. And I call that phenomena anticipointment. You kind of have this anticipation, like I got the product and I want to buy it. You walk into the store and it's not there and you get disappointed. So we wanted to make sure we avoid that phenomena of anticipointment and, and wow the users by giving them this perfect information and giving them this assurance that this item is actually on the shelf right now in store near you. And then last but not the least, you can obviously click on get directions and it'll guide you to that store. What can be better than that? And this is really changing how people think about shopping because back in the days, there was this clear distinction between what was online shopping versus shopping at the store. The reality is that there is no such distinction. These worlds are merging. A lot of times users will walk into the store but complete the transaction in the online world. Or vice versa, which is a more common scenario, they'll start their research online but finish the transaction at a physical store. And there are various reasons why they do so. And as a retailer, as an e-commerce website owner, you want to make sure that you give the best choice to the consumer and let them pick what's most convenient for them. And this kind of local shopping and mobile blends these two worlds perfectly. So what are Google Shopping's APIs? And, and how does it relate to all the innovations that I showed you uh, on Google.com? So the shopping APIs are essentially divided into two segments. So this is kind of my style of drawing a simple architectural diagram. So bear with me uh, as I try to walk you through very bare-bone components here. But if you look at the heart of it is we have something called Google Merchant Center, which is our master, webmaster kind of tools for uploading data to Google. How many people are aware of Google Merchant Center? Okay, so this is pretty good. Uh, looks like you know at least half of the audience. But, but for those of you who are not aware of it, Google Merchant Center is our simple dashboard where you as a developer, or if you're working for a retailer, can interact with it to upload the items that you sell on your website or in a physical store near you. And what you see at the bottom of this slide is two different avenues. So you can either upload this data, what's, what we call it product data feeds. These are simple XML of, or Excel files, and you can simply go to the Merchant Center and click File Upload and upload that file. Or you can use this new API, which is the content API for shopping. And this API has much more tighter libraries, so it's much more easier from a developer to program against them. 
um, and integrate back into your system. Also, the content API allows you to do more incremental updates. So one of the most common requirements we see is to update price and inventory, right? During the day, a retailer changes its price multiple times. So if you change your price from $60 to $49, you want to make sure that that price is updated within minutes. So the content API allows you to do that. As well as if you went out of the stock with some item, you can do so without uploading your entire inventory. So you can make those fine grain incremental updates. So we're gonna talk a lot about content API today, um, but you know, at this point I just wanted to give you a high level overview. And then on the, on the client side, obviously I showed you a lot of innovations on google.com, which is the box Google Shopping represents. But what's more interesting, you can take those same innovations and power search on your own e-commerce site. So we have an API called Search API for Shopping, which allows you to take a lot of innovations that are happening on Google to power the e-commerce experience on your website. And also that API allows you to monetize the data inventory feed we have at Google. So you can be our publisher, what we call it Google Affiliate Network. So you can be an affiliate for that Google Affiliate Network and publish some of these items. And this applies to anybody. You don't need to be a retailer. If you're a website owner, blogger, or publisher, you can leverage that API to monetize your website better. So we're gonna talk about both those APIs in a lot more detail. And these are the two components. Uh, but at this point, let me introduce to you a colleague of mine, Ali, and he's going to take you over to the details of Content API. Ali, thank you. Thank you, Nitin. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, as Nitin said, I'm an uh, engineer working in Zurich on the shopping APIs. Uh, I work for developer relations, and really my goal is to help people use the APIs and make sure they're successful with them. So let's start. Well, hopefully Nitin's explained this, but I just want to recap who should be using the content API for shopping. Well, anyone who sells anything online, firstly. Now, that's so that people can find your products when they search on Google.com and Google Product Search. That's the first thing. And secondly, as he's told you, um, and the research shows that people do research their purchases online, even if they're going to purchase offline. So for that reason, um, if you sell things offline, you should have your products in Google Shopping using our content API. So that equates to retailers. If you are a retailer, anyone? If you work for a retailer, if you write software that a retailer uses, ERP systems, um, online shopping systems, this is an API you should, in my opinion, be interested in. Right, let's start from the very beginning. Um, sorry if this is all very basic information, but I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So they're HTTP-based APIs um, in the same way that your web browser is. Um, we have a resource, and that resource has a URI associated with it. We make a request that's identical to a web request. That can be any one of the verbs that we have get, post, put, delete. There are others, but those are the important ones we'll be looking at today. And we get a response back, and that response can contain the data in any of the data formats, uh, such as JSON and XML, which are the ones we're going to be using today. So if you're familiar with RESTful APIs, if you've heard of the concept REST, this is all going to be a bit more obvious for you. But essentially, we have resources, we make requests, and we get responses back. What is the data format like? Well, I said it was either XML or JSON, and you do have a choice with this API whether you use XML or JSON. Uh, the default format is XML for this API, and that really suits the more enterprisey field. Enterprises like using XML. Um, it's built on GData and the Atom syndication format, so that we have a feed corresponds to a list of products, and an Atom entry corresponds to an individual product. And inside there, we have the various product attributes. Oops, sorry. Uh, you can see there the title, the Atom title. This is for an army knife, a Swiss army knife. I live in Zurich, so uh, we love our knives. Um, and you can repeat some elements in there. So that's the very high overview of that. And we'll look at the individual uh, data model. So each product we have, each product you give us, you send to us is uniquely identified by those four components you see there. The channel by which you're selling it, which is online, EN there, which is the language, the country, US, and your SKU, your individual code for that. So those four components are stuck together to make the unique ID for the product. That's worth knowing 
Why? Because if you upload the same product for a different country or the same product with a different language, that's regarded by our system as a different product. So inside that product, we have various attributes. I've only got the title one up there. And each product can belong to a number of product categories. And we provide a taxonomy for that that is fairly comprehensive, so it should cover all your product needs. As you'll see, we recommend you use all of these. The schema itself, um, we have created a new namespace, a couple of namespaces to add on to the Atom namespace to extend. But you can see the title is the product title. The content is the product description. The link is the link to the product page. That's really important. We don't host your product information. We require a link from you, or a URL, to a place where people can see information about that product. Now, typically, that's, you, you know what I'm talking about. There's an image there. There's the price there. You can click Add to Cart and some product information. But we really require that. Um, and then there are some individual um, elements for our API. So the target country, that comprises part of the uh, ID that I said. The uh, content language, that's the language of the content element. Uh, the condition, we do require you to tell us the condition of the product, new, used, or refurbished. Information about the price, including currency, and some images, or one or more images. We do ask for one high quality image, at least. Uh, so those are the important required elements. There are many more, 30 or 40, and they're well documented. Uh, you can see the links afterwards. Right, before I show the actual request and response, I want to give you some tips for getting your products higher in the ranking, okay? Um, this is really important. And they're all really, really common sense. So you think, oh, but that's common sense. But actually, if you do all of them, it will significantly improve your rankings. So firstly, fill out as, much, as many fields as you can. Um, our user of this product, Google Shopping, Google.com, is the person trying to find something. So it's, it's me trying to buy a digital camera, or it's you trying to buy something that you want, a bicycle. Um, those are the users. And we're really keen at Google to give users exactly what they're looking for, the best data. And we can give them that data if you give it to us. So firstly, fill out as many fields as you, as you can. Secondly, use good quality images. Um, people love looking at stuff. We all love looking at stuff. And if you can see something you're going to buy, that's a really, really strong motivator to actually buy it. Um, we do check that the images you give us do exist. We do check that the product pages do exist. We do check that the prices on the product page is accurate to the, the information that you've sent us. And if any of those, if there are discrepancies with those, that can adversely affect your rankings. Um, product identifiers. I very briefly mention this here. Um, books have ISBN numbers, products have UPC codes, and more recently there's a GTIN code that um, is used by both of them. It's a generalization of both of them. Now, if you give us these identifiers, then we can accurately place your product on one of those catalog pages. So we know that the digital camera is the exact same digital camera, and that will put you in that, in that catalog page. And also, it's very good for your, very good for your rankings as well. Product categories. People do like to search by category. They do like to browse products by category. Um, and if you use our taxonomy, then we can provide the results when people are looking for them. Again, it's all about the user. It's all about the person who's looking. So if you give us the information, then we can index it accurately. Good titles and good descriptions. This is my favorite one. Uh, don't write your titles in all capitals. Use good punctuation. Ensure they're well spelled. We do check all of these things. And again, we want to give the user a good experience. So we don't want to show them all capitals, so we won't. Um, and the last one is more general. Include information about tax and shipping. Uh, I've had the same experience. If I don't know how much tax I'm going to pay on a product, I just won't even consider buying from that site. If I don't know how much it's going to cost to get sent to me, I won't even consider. And it's so important. I don't know if you noticed, but on Nitin's demonstration, with all the merchants, alongside reviews, it had tax and shipping information. It's that important that we want to show that to users immediately, because it, it can affect what they, where they decide to buy from. So those are my tips. Uh, if you want to discuss any of them in detail with me, please do. I'm around all day today and tomorrow. So let's get on to the actual API. Well, we have, you saw there was a resource and that, that had a URI. There are two types of resource we use, mainly for our content API. The first one is the products endpoint. Now that 
is used for any operation which is general for all the products of a merchant. For example, if you want to insert a product, that's not specific to a single product, and so we would use this endpoint, or to retrieve a list of all your products. Now, that's made up of a few bits. The root URI, that's the URI of the API. Then the merchant ID is only 12345, and all merchants who have signed up to the merchant center have an ID. The path, and then the projection. I won't be talking about the projection. It's an advanced option on how we return some extended parts of XML. Uh, you can read about that, and again, that's something I can talk to you about individually if you're interested. So that's the product endpoint. That's where we send any request which is general for the, general for the merchant. The second endpoint is a specific endpoint for every single product. So it's identical up until the point where we add on the end the four-part product ID that I spoke about earlier. So you can see it's joined by colons, and it's made up of those four segments that I spoke about. And when will we use this endpoint? Well, if we have a specific product operation, if we want to update the information, if we want to delete the information, this is the endpoint we'd use. So what we have online is, it's in our Google Code site, is an interactive demo of this API. Now, I find it the best way for someone to get their feet wet uh, to warm themselves up with the API. What it allows you to do is enter your values either in a form or as raw XML. You make the request, and you can see that. I don't know if you can see with the, the resolution, but as I say, I strongly recommend all of you to go and try this. It shows you the request you make and then the response. And all I've done is, because you can't see this too well, taken some segments out of here so we can talk about them specifically. You'll see the link for that later. Please use it, it's really useful. So the first thing we want to do is create a new product, upload a product to Google Shopping. And this is probably the most common use case. How do we do that? Well, we make a post request. So inserting products, always a post request. And we make it to the product's URI, the feed URI for that merchant. You can also see that we pass a couple of extra headers. The first one is the authorization header. Now, all requests for this need to be authorized. We're using AuthSub here, but it supports all of our authorization methods. And they're talking about OAuth and OAuth2 here at the conference. So if you're interested in that part of it, please go and have a look at them. But all requests need to be authorized because we can't let anyone just manage your information. And the last one is the content type. And we're using Atom, application Atom plus XML. And this is what the body of the request looks like. So first thing you notice, well, it's XML, and we've encoded it as UTF-8. Please feel free to encode it as whatever you like, as long as it's UTF-8. No, no, as whatever you like. Um, and then you see the entry element that we have. We've got a few namespaces. I've left some out for brevity, and I've actually left out some required fields here. So what you would have is slightly bigger than this, but you can see the title, the content type text, the SCID element, which is the SKU, the condition element, the price, which has the unit of currency, the unit is required, and then some tax information. Now, tax is specifically localizable, so you can say, I want the tax in California to be such and such, or I want the tax in this zip code to be such and such, or around this city to be however you like. So you can specify arbitrarily complex tax rules there. And what do we get back? Well, we've just sent a product. We've created a new product. Brilliant. And so we get back a 201 response, which means you've created. This is interesting. From a REST point of view, not only have we created a new product, we've created a new REST resource, a new place where you can do stuff. And so we get back in the headers a location header, which shows us our new resource with our new URI. So you can store that and use that if you want to update the information later. And with that, we get a response back that is an echo of our original request. So it tells us that the fields we've added have been successful, and with a few others added, such as the published, which tells us that it's been published and the date and time, the APP edited, that's the Atom Publishing Protocol namespace, I've added here a couple of elements that weren't in the original post request, and which we would have needed to have. And there you see, really important, the link rel equals alternate element that is the landing page for, that, for this product. This is the page that people would go to. So that's inserting products. I think the most common use case. 
as you'll see, you can use this for updating products as well. But I'm just going to show you how to update a product. Now, this time, instead of doing a post request, we would do a put request to the specific product URI, which is there, and the same as the product URI we just got back when we created it. Again, it needs to be authorized, and we need to provide the content type header. We send exactly the same body. Well, it's not exactly the same because you might be keen and notice that I've gone on sale and I've reduced my price slightly. So if I want to update a product, I send exactly the same as I would to insert a new product with the additional information, but this time I send it to the specific product URI with a put request. And we get back a 200. We haven't created anything new. We've just updated, so it's just a simple 200 with, again, the information that we echoed and we got back. The third important use case is deleting products. Well, that's really easy. We don't, you don't need to send anything. You don't really get anything back as a body. You just send the delete request, and you get it to the specific product endpoint, and you just get the response back. And that's how you delete a product. One of our most important features for this API is that we support batch processing. Now, a batch is a set of operations, each one with a product associated with it. So by operation, I mean you can insert product A, you can update product B, you can delete product C. So each product in a feed comes with an operation. And the advantage of that is you can put firstly hundreds in a single request. Um, and so you just save the amount of requests you have to make. And that can go up to a megabyte in size, which is gzipped. So we'll see in a little example of that. But if you're like most, most merchants, and most merchants don't have 10 or 15 products, they have hundreds and hundreds of thousands of products. Some merchants here have hundreds of millions of products. So if you batch them, that's, that's really advantageous for you because you make fewer requests. Also, we get individual responses for each batched operation. So you will know which ones succeed, and you will know which ones fail, and you will get the error information that you need. Let's have a look at one. All batch requests are a post to the batch URI, which is the products feed with the word batch attached on the end of it. So they're all posts. It doesn't matter what kind of operation, because you will specify the type of operation in, in the entries themselves. And here's a batch body with just one operation in there. So imagine there could be hundreds in there. Again, it's a feed at the top level, and it's a simple entry exactly like our other entries. And my laser pointer's gone. Um, you can see there that there's the batch element. And that batch element is, has an operation type, and that type is insert. So this will insert this product if we send the batch. And when we send the batch, we're always going to get a 200 back. Even if we sent 100 operations that were all complete garbage and none of them succeeded, we will still get a 200 back because the batch itself did succeed. And this is what the response looks like. Well, it's identical to our other responses. But it does have the addition, firstly, of the batch operation that we had passed, and then, importantly, the response code for that batch, which it, in this case is the 201 created, identical to the response we got back when we made the insert request. So that's batching. I recommend you all use it if you're uploading products. We also have real-time updates. Now, normally, when you upload a product to, to Google product search, it takes a few hours. You're thinking, why, why does that take a few hours? Well, we have to validate it. We have to make sure that the, the page exists, the product's accurate, the information is accurate, because we can't risk people putting mm, false information, or we don't want to risk that bad experience for the user. So it takes a while to check. But the really important information, and that is the price and the quantity, as in your inventory of the stock, if you change that, we have a special fast track. So that means within, well, I've said five minutes, but it's actually shorter. So almost immediately, that result will be reflected in product search. That's really great, because as Nitin said, people like to know when, there's, when their product's in stock. They, in fact, they need to know. So give them the most accurate information as quickly as possible, and people are more likely to buy stuff off you. We also have other features. I'm just going to race through this. Firstly, inserts for existing items are updates. So if you try and insert the same item twice, and by the same item using that four-part ID, the second time won't create a new item. It will merely update the old item. Okay, So that's the quickest way 
to update an item. The difference with a normal update is that in a normal update, if the product doesn't exist, you'll get an error. You can't update a product that doesn't exist. Whereas here, it will just go on and create the product. So this is the quickest way of updating your product information. We also have a data feed API. Nitin mentioned that you can, you can upload your products using data feeds. It's a bit slower, it takes a bit longer, but you can manage these feeds programmatically. You can say, these are my feeds, or these are the third party's feeds who I manage. Here they are, and this is how you upload them. Also, we provide aggregator accounts so that you don't have, you may have multiple accounts underneath you. You may manage multiple accounts. And to do that, we have a specific API that manages products for those sub accounts. And you can use them for a third party if that's the kind of business, if you're in an aggregator type business. Think of the marketplaces. Just a little example of when, just to put it into context. Now, this is the, the, the simplest flow you can have. So you have an ERP system. If you're a normal retailer, you have an ERP system. But when something changes, you send a notification to your module that will handle this, and that will make a single call to the content API for shopping. You write it once, and you just leave it forever. And for the rest of time, your products will be accurate in Google product search. All the time, up to date, people can find them, and people will be able to buy them. So the content API for shopping, an HTTP-based API based on Atom and GData by default. You use it to manage your product data for Google product search and Google shopping. You use it to manage data feeds for yourself or third parties, and you can manage sub-accounts. So that's that. I'll get Nitin back up here to talk about our other APIs. Great. Thanks, Ali. Uh, switching gears here a bit. Uh, so, so far you saw a lot of innovations that were happening on Google Shopping, and Ali went into the details of how can you use Content API to upload your items uh, to Google so that it shows up on various properties on Google, be it Shopper, Google Shopping, and things like that. I'm going to switch gears here and talk about the other side of our APIs, which is once you uploaded data to Google, and there's so much of innovations happening on Google, how can you benefit from those innovations and power your own e-commerce site with the search APIs that Google provides? So the search API that we provide for that is called search API for shopping. And the number one use case for search API for shopping is something we call it Google Commerce Search. Uh, this one is actually a paid product, Google Commerce Search, uh, which allows you to power e-commerce experience on your own website. So let me show you a live demo to illustrate what exactly this product does and how shopping APIs are used. So if I go to <clears throat> you know, one of our customers' website, this is Baby Age, which is a pure play online e-commerce website. And the search here is powered by the API, the search API, which is based on the items they uploaded to Google. So for example, if I'm searching for a stroller, as you could see here, we leverage all the features that you see on Google. So the first thing you see is, search auto completion. So we are showing you these suggestions, strollers for babies, strollers with car seats. But then what's more interesting is you also see instant, which is you're seeing the actual results even before you finished your query. So literally with three or four keystrokes, we are able to predict what the user is looking for and in sub-second show him or her all the products with the images, the title, as well as the price. Now you can go ahead and finish this query or you can pick one of these um, suggestions and you can see that as I'm mouse hovering these suggestions, the actual search results are changing. So this is all real time, kind of Google Instant, but for your own retail website. At this point, if I hit enter, I see much more comprehensive search results. So you see a lot more details now, whether this item is in stock or not. But what's more interesting is things on the left-hand side. So in case of e-commerce, people not only like to do search, but they like to do more refined searches. So it's like, I'm looking for a stroller, but I want the brand to be Brightex. So just by clicking on that brand Brightex, you can see now all the strollers are only from the brand Brightex. And similarly, you can further refine and say, I'm looking for a price between $300 to $500. And now you can see only those products where brand is Brightex and the price is between $300 to $500. What's, what's cool about this is this number, 200 milliseconds. Because when you're building an e-commerce site, the last thing you want is it slows you down. The technology slows you down. And you want to make sure that your e-commerce site is not only fast, it's interactive. Think about the experience uh, when you walk into the store. 
What do you like about it? The things you like about when you walk into a store is somebody is speaking back to you. And you want to make sure that your website is fast enough and is interactive. And that's why we build these features like search as you type and instant because it looks like as if the website is talking back to you. This is not like a static website where you're typing in your entire query, hitting enter and waiting five seconds before you see the first re search result. This is much more interactive, more real time, and this is all based on the search API for shopping. The beauty about this model here is that because this retailer, BabyH, has already uploaded their data items to Google so that it shows up on Google Shopping, they can use that exact same feed to power search on their own website. And there's a product around it, it's called Google Commerce Search, uh, which provides a lot more features. And the actual product itself is a paid product, but we do offer a developer API. Uh, it, it gives you around 2,500 requests a day, so if you want to build a quick application and a prototype, you can do it, there's no charge for it. Once you use it for production use, um, it's a paid product. Let me show you a quick demo to kind of explain a little bit more because um, I, I don't have many slides on Google Commerce Search, but just to kind of set the stage here, this is one of the demos we built for you. So if we can, uh, Let me try to play it. Since the dawn of time, people have engaged in commerce. In the Stone Age, age cavemen traded in rocks. At the height of the Roman Empire, people bartered for chickens. Then came coffins, plastic, and finally, online shopping. Yay. This evolution in commerce got us thinking about the future of retail. And that's why we built the all new Google Commerce Search. It's an e commerce search solution that makes buying easy and selling very profitable. Here's how it works. Let's say you run cavewheelhouse.com, a website that sells stone caveman wheels. Buyers visit cavewheelhouse.com to search for and purchase wheels, and with Google's new search as you type feature, they find relevant wheels in just a few keystrokes. As the wheel merchant, you have absolute control over the search elements the customer sees on your webpage. You can easily introduce promotions for discounted tricycle wheels, high-performance racing wheels, and more, and have these automatically display when your visitor enters a related search query. You can also designate banner zones. You can even collaborate with your colleague, the wheel marketer, and any other caveman you desire. The result? Wheel enthusiasts find the exact wheel they're searching for, and maybe even something unexpected along the way. And if you have a cave wheelhouse brick and mortar store with those items in stock, Google Commerce Search even lets your shopper know that their items are available nearby. By connecting visitors to relevant products faster than ever before, your business can sell many more wheels. Start the next era of your e-commerce store with Google Commerce Search. Cool. Well, I just wanted to spend a few minutes to explain to you. It's essentially an e-commerce search platform, uh, and at the heart of it, it uses the search API to power the complete e-commerce experience on your website. So whether you are a retailer uh, with a brick and mortar store or you're a peer play online, or you just have an e-commerce website and you want to get the full experience that you see on Google, uh, you can do so using this product um, and the actual APIs. Let me show you one last thing before I uh, move back to the slides and go into the details of APIs. So let's take one example. I want to show you like, what does it take to build a new search engine if you have an e-commerce website? So in this case, Forever 21, which is one of our customers, they already upload data to Google. So this is Google product search. They're already giving a data feed and they're actually using the new content API, which Ali went in the details to upload items to Google. So these are all the items that uh, Forever 21 has already um, uploaded to Google. And let's say if they wanted to build a new search engine for their own website, all they would do is they would go to this wizard, Commerce Search Create Wizard. They would put in their name, which is Forever 21, uh, select the language, country. This is the ID which we give it to them. So every merchant has a unique merchant ID which we give it to them. And this is the developer key which, uh, which they enter. At this point, you can go ahead and create the search engine and I can finish it. And basically, once you have created this search engine, you can try any of the queries here. So if I'm trying, for example, trousers. This is in real time searching for data that Forever 21 has already uploaded to Google. So without writing a single line of code, we can generate a basic bare-bone e-commerce search engine 
for any of the retailers that have uploaded data to Google. Now you can take the same template and obviously put your own styling guideline because you want to make sure that it's unique to your taste and audience and plug it into your website. And what's more interesting is that on the left-hand side, we can actually go and generate some code for you guys. So there's some auto-generation of code going here, which we can also do that. Now, at the end result, what you would see, and this is actually a true example, is if I go to forever21.com, and they actually use Google Commerce Search, uh, you can search for any of these items, and you can see the UI in the layout looks different than what was on that kind of a quick demo, is because they could take that code, apply their styling, and then power the experience on their own website. And then obviously you can further refine these search results, whether you're looking for knit tops and things like that. And this is again powered by Google. So that's kind of the overall view of Google Commerce Search. Um, I want to talk about one more uh, use case uh, before um, I hand it back to Ali uh, to, to go into the details of the Search API. The other use case which is uh, pretty useful um, is Google Affiliate Network. So let's say you are a publisher. You, you have a website or you have a blog and you want to monetize your website. One way to do that is that you can use the data feed from Google to put the items that are available from various retailers, and you can basically make money through the referral fee. So if there's a user who clicks on that item and actually makes the purchase back on the retailer's site, uh, we, we share the, the commission with you. And what you need to do is two things. You need to sign up to become a Google affiliate publisher, and then you need to request the key so that you can place these items on your website. So those are the two main use cases. You are either a developer working with a retailer, or you are just a publisher and you want to like to monetize your website better, you can do so with the Google Affiliate Network. Um, and as I mentioned to you, it's relatively straightforward. If you do a Google on Google Affiliate Network, uh, it will take you to the, to the details on how do you sign up. So with that, why don't I ask Ali to come back to the stage and um, walk you through the Search API uh, details. Ali. Thank you again, Nitin. Right, the Search API for shopping. As Nitin said, you use it to get product search like results in a programmatic way. Um, it's much, much simpler than the content API for shopping. Firstly, it's only read only. We don't send any information, we're only getting information. So all operations are get requests and all operations go to a single URI resource. And that URI resource contains as part of it, again, the merchant ID. So you're getting products from, from the specific merchant. So all get requests, all to the same URI. The data format this time, by default, is JSON. Again, you have a choice, but the default format is JSON. Now, why, why is this the case? Uh, well, we feel that the applications that would use this API would benefit from a lighter data format, uh, one that would run natively in a browser, run on mobile platforms, and that's the kind of application that we think would use this API. Again, you can use XML if you want to. Um, the JSON is equivalent to the XML, so we have attributes in the JSON that correspond to elements in the XML itself. These are the main attributes, and you can see there's a big similarity with the, the ones we sent for the content API. The title of the product, the content, the description, the link, the homepage for the product, uh, the country that corresponds to the target country, and the language, again, the content language. We give all the other information that you've provided or the merchant has provided, we give that back to in the condition element, the price element, any number of images. So it's a JSON format. And this is just an example of what it looks like. So I've done a search there for, oops, done a search there for strollers and I got 513,000 results. Um, and this is just the first one, and I've even cut off the description because it would have gone on for ages. Um, so this is the kind of result that we get back. That's just an example. Now to go through what Nitin actually did. We provide options to the API by providing URI parameters. Now Nitin searched for a stroller. I don't know if you noticed S, he typed, then ST. Now each time he typed a character, a web request was being made and they looked like that. So the first one was just Q equals S, ST, STR, STRO, and each time he was getting a response back, and that was being rendered in the page, and that's what gives the instant, instant results. So that's how you do that, free text search using the Q parameter. 
We also have structured search results. You noticed he did a, a narrowing his results down by the brand Brightax, and we have the restrict by parameter that you can pass most of the attributes that you can have in there, and you can restrict the operation. So if you want just a Brightax brand, you pass restrict by equals brand Brightax. Uh, if you just want brand new baby equipment, it's probably likely, then you just pass condition new. Also, we have a method by which we will rank the results that we'll give back to you. So you don't need to order them yourself, and that's useful if there are 500,000 results. But you can rank by price, by um, relevance of your results, and by the date published uh, in both directions, so ascending and descending. One really cool feature of this API is that we provide result diversification. When you're doing a search, if you search for a digital camera, you may notice that the first 50 are all from a certain brand or all from a certain publisher. Um, this allows us to say, I only want one result from each brand, or I only want one result from each retailer. And in this case, we pass the parameter that we want and then the number of results for that parameter. So I want one result for each brand. There are other attributes and other ways that we can do structured search, and that's all in our documentation. This is just a quick overview. Um, and there are other features, as I say, and these features relate to cool Google stuff that is good. Firstly, spelling. So if someone misspells a product, we pick that up, and in our results, if you ask for them, we give back a did you mean style thing for the, the product that they were actually looking for, and we give those recommendations for how it should be spelled. Thumbnails. Remember I kept saying about high quality images? Why do we need high quality images? Because we create thumbnails for you. We create any number of thumbnails of any size up to 226 pixels. We will give them back to you. So in your request, you pass thumbnails equals, well, I want four thumbnails, 6428. Name them like that, and the API will create them and give you links back. Even cooler than that, if you're doing search instant search, the thumbnail data will be inlined in the response. So all you need to do then is just render them straight back. You don't need to make additional requests to get the thumbnails. And that's how you get that instant result with the, with the thumbnail images next to them. We also provide histograms so you can get a spread of the data. You give us a number of slots. I want price slots. And it will split it up into that number, say 10, and it will give you how many products for each price slot. That's useful if you want to compare your prices with the whole ecosystem of prices. We provide field filtering, which means we don't always give back all the, result, all the fields in every response. You can specify which ones you want, and that's useful if for quick responses where you don't want the whole 40-line description. You just want the title, you just want the price, and you just want a thumbnail, so you can specify that. And like all APIs, if we're returning hundreds of results, we'll give you a way that you can page the results. So you can get the next 100, and then the next 100, and then the next 100, if that's what you want to do. There are other features as well. And uh, again, they're all documented. But it's all about trying to get the results back fast so you can display them to your users. So that's the search API for shopping. A quicker run through, because it's a simpler API with just the one endpoint. It's again HTTP based. This time, the default data format is JSON, but you can use JSON or XML. And it loosely, it searches products programmatically in the same way that you would do if you're on Google Shopping or Google Product Search. You can use it for the Google Affiliate Network, and you can use it for Google Commerce Search. So that's the search API for shopping. Right, that's mostly all done. Thanks for bearing with me. Um, to put my commerce hat on for a second, I just want to discuss the two important things in business. You guys are into business and commerce because that's why you're here and not somewhere else. So what's the most important thing in business? Anyone? Well, obviously, you're making money. Um, so hopefully, we've shown you how to make money by driving traffic to your site by uploading products with the Content API for shopping. The traffic is driven not just through Google Shopping. It's driven through Google.com. People will type something in Google.com, and within a click, they will be on your site if you use the Content API for shopping. I'm just going to pause there, because that's really important. OK, that's the first thing. Second most important thing in business, anyone? Making more money. Making more money. Thank you very much. 
I knew someone would know. So you can make even more money. You can improve your conversion rates by using Google Commerce Search. People will find what they're looking for immediately, and they will buy it because you've got a good experience. And that shows that when people can find stuff, they buy it. You can make a little bit even more money if you're a publisher, if you've got any content. You can include results, product results, on your blog, on your website, in your application that has product-related stuff. And you will receive money when people click on those and convert on those. So my most important things in business. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, we'll take questions, and good luck with all your ventures. If you do have questions, by the way, uh, come up to the microphone. It's really important. So we have, we have 10 minutes or so for questions. So if you guys can please line up. Go ahead. Sure. Um, does Google plan to monetize the shopping themselves with AdWords? Uh, so the question is, does Google plan to monetize shopping? Uh, it's actually already monetized. So if you go to Google Shopping, uh, there, there is AdWords just like Google, uh, which are plate placements. And then there are organic results, uh, which are free. So we don't charge for content API if you want to upload data to Google. But then you can place AdWords on that results as well. Uh, in terms of uh, inventory information, in stock, out of stock information, and I think that at this point that's not a required field. Do you see that becoming required in the near future? Uh, so there's two things around inventory. Uh, one is your online availability. Right? So we do want to know whether this item is out of stock or is it available. And the second part is your in-store availability. So if you have both online presence as well as in-store presence, the in-store availability is not a required field. In fact, currently it's a separate API and a feed because it requires a lot more complexity to give us feed for all your stores. You might have hundreds of stores uh, just in North America. Uh, and that's completely optional. We are slowly rolling that program out. Um, and basically, we can associate both these feeds together so we know that this is you as a retailer who's giving us both those feeds. But more important for the online. Well, it depends. You know, I think uh, if, you are, if you have both online presence as well as a physical store presence, I think it's in your best interest to give us your physical store inventory too. Because as I showed you in the slides earlier, 90% of the revenue is still happening in the physical stores. And you want to get that foot traffic as well, right? Um, oh, actually, OK, go ahead. That's OK. I think we have time to take OK, I have two questions, actually. Sorry. Um, one, uh, the taxonomy for categories. Um, we have feeds in several languages, but I haven't figured out how to do the taxonomy for any language but English. Are you doing that translation behind the scenes, or are you going to release the other languages eventually? Or We do. I mean, I mean we do yeah. have a separate spec. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, use the taxonomy in English, and then it will be It'll translated. automatically. Yeah. OK, that's yeah, good. Yeah. That, um, that's the safest way to do it, because um, certain products don't translate that well. Certain certain words that describe products don't just translate that well. So yeah, use the English taxonomy. OK, and I apologize to the other people behind me. Um, the second, second question is um, for the individual product updating. I know for the batch product uploading, there's a cap to the number of products you can send, um, both per feed and overall for your account. Um, how does that cap translate to the individual products? Do some disappear when you upload more, or is there no cap, or what? Um, the, the short answer is that almost every operation you can possibly do does have a cap. So we can have caps on, and I can't go into details, but number of products you've uploaded, number of operations. It's all capped because we don't want to get spammed, and we don't want to get denial of service detect. But the caps are all very, very high. So, and if you do reach one of the caps, you can just ask for an increase, and there's no problem. So um, you would get like an error response if you reached a yeah, cap of well, some you kind? Get, you get a specific response, too many operations. OK, That's that the would error be good. message, so you'll know. Um, it's unlikely that the small to medium people will, will encounter this. But we're keen for the data. So we're that keen for the data that we will keep increasing your cap if that's what you need. We do okay. investigate the use case, but yeah, you shouldn't well, have I mean, any problem. Yeah, I mean, the point here, what Ali is saying, is that we want to validate your account and understand that, indeed, you need a higher cap. And if we, if we feel like you should support, file a support ticket with our operations team, then we'll look at your application. OK, thank Hopefully you. Hopefully, you're not hitting that limit right now. So Management also. We're, we are hitting answer. the limit, yes. But yeah. OK, cool. Thank you. Thanks. Why don't we take a couple of questions on that? Go ahead. Uh, just a question about the categories um, on the left. Are they customizable, like size and color and all that? On, on your own website? On your own website. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. So we call it them facets or parametric search. Okay. So things that you see on a, you know, let's just go back here. Um, 
what I was showing here in one of the demos, the things that you see on the left-hand side, for example, you know, things like price, brand, so these things are called facets, and they are fully customizable. For example, if you were in, uh, you know, you're selling appliances, you can have a field on the left-hand side which is BTU, or convection oven, or regular oven, things like that. So you can decide what you want on the left-hand navigation. Yeah, great, thanks. Fully customizable. Yeah. You, mentioned that you, you mentioned that you had to validate the pricing information. Do you guys do it often where like it would come by a couple times a day or something like that? So if we don't give you the information fast enough, you may say our information's invalid and we would decrease our search rankings? Or do you have a little buffer with that? Um, the, the situation you've described could happen. Yeah, but the, the good thing is we check again. So it may not be valid for the period of time that we couldn't access the home page. So, or, or for example, the price was incorrect. So we do recheck, but yeah, make sure, I mean, that's a good tip. Make sure your data is accurate when you upload to us. I mean, you know, it's, it's also good for you, right? I mean, look, if, if you're running a business, uh, whether you have a pure play online or you have a physical store, as your prices are changing, you want the consumers to know about this change, right? And most likely, the prices, you're doing some discounting or, or, or they're going down. And in that case, you actually, it's in your best interest that the consumer knows that the price went from, for this camera, which was like $199 to $149, right? And having that discrepancy leaves a bad taste both in the consumer's thing and it also disturbs you. Now, there are some instances which we have seen, I'm sure it's not you guys, but where people are on purposefully giving us wrong data. Right, which you know, I think there's a term in the industry they call it uh, bait and switch. Right, and we, we definitely want to make sure that you know we catch those issues and and we you know basically you know uh, disable those feeds because that doesn't help the entire ecosystem. Right, we want people to be genuine. But if it is a technical issue, a few hours later we are monitoring this and we'll notify to you. And the reason we created this new content API is exactly with that use case in mind. That you don't need to upload if you are selling a million items. And let's say you change the price only for 10 items. You don't need to upload your entire data feed for those million items again to Google. You can just write a small program which updates price for those 10 items. And within five or 10 minutes, we would go and update the price. So I highly encourage you, if you are in a situation where your prices are changing within a day, multiple times, please leverage Content API for shopping. If your prices don't change, then feeds are fine. You can upload once in a day, and we'll take care of it. Hi, thank you. Thanks. Good. Uh, mine is an interface question. Um, I, when you look at uh, sites like Shopping.com and Price Grabber, they're all laid out uh, in a much more usable format. But when you go to Google Shopping, things are in different places and they're a little bit wonky. I'm wondering if you're gonna, if the plan is to work on the interface for the consumer. Well, I mean, the Google Shopping is a is a consumer interface. I mean, you know, if you go to Google, uh, you can type in a query, for example digital camera or any of the other queries. And we show the search results right on the first page, right? So we are driving a lot of value to both the consumer, right? So when a consumer comes to Google, he or she can have multiple intentions. Maybe he just wants to do research on what digital camera is and you know, what's a zoom lens and things like that. Or maybe he wants to buy, so we want to show this information right here to the consumer. Now, at this point, you know, we are driving a lot of traffic back to the uh, retailers, but obviously we want to give them the full information here. So this is absolutely tailored towards both consumer and retailer. As far as usability is concerned, you know, we do a lot of experimentation. So without committing on, commenting on some of the other players that you mentioned, we have our own usability team, and we do a lot of research on what consumers like. And it's a hard science, you know, right? There's no perfect answer, and that's why we do a lot of A-B testing, much like you guys do on your own website, to determine what things appeal most to the consumers and try to tailor our website around it. But having said that, if you've got any specific suggestions or feedback yeah, or ways, on the no, shop, come, okay. and, come and see me because okay. we're kind of, we've yeah. only got 50 seconds left. Right, sure. But come and see me, I'll write them down and I'll take them to the shopping team. Thanks, we appreciate all your feedback. Cool, well, uh, I think we are, we are out of time here. I yeah. want to thank everyone here. Uh, I think we are in a very exciting times here on the commerce and shopping in general. And uh, we want to work with the broader ecosystem so whether you're a developer, a publisher, or a retailer, uh, we absolutely want to work with you. And this is why shopping APIs are so critical. As Ali mentioned, we both would be here, uh, as well as we, we have the office hours. So happy to get more feedback from you, inputs, and as well as insights. So thank you once again. Enjoy your day.
Thank you, everyone.